encourage you to take a copy of the Bible and open up to Mark chapter 4. It's where we will be today, Mark 4. Originally, I had planned to go through verse 20, but we're actually going to go through verse 25 today, Mark chapter 4. Now, um, one of the stories in our family that gets told very often um, is one of a relative who had recently returned from a trip to Japan. And at a family gathering, she was sharing uh, the story, at least I believe it was Japan, it was somewhere far away, um, I need to probably fact check that, but they had, she was cheering about her trip. Uh, and of course, she had spent a considerable amount of time there, and so there was a lot to tell to this story. And of course, as it so happened, there was an older relative who was sitting in the room and was listening to the story. But as it turns out, this relative was hard of hearing, and of course, as we're going to find, didn't quite gather or understand everything. So this relative, as she talked about her trip, talked about all the places that she visited, talked about all the people that she met, all the food that she ate. As I said, it was a long trip, so it took a long time to kind of tell the story. But as I said, it became pretty clear that this older relative had no idea what the story was actually about, because when she got finished telling the story, he looked at her and says, so, so you went to the beach? And that's kind of become the punchline in, you know, in our family for a long time. Although he heard her words, he had no idea what she was actually talking about. And that's what we're going to often see in the ministry of Jesus. People hear his words physically. They may even comprehend what he's talking about. But in order to truly understand what he is teaching, they need not just physical ears, but they need spiritual ears, spiritual healing, or spiritual hearing as well. So if you've got your place in Mark chapter 4, I invite you to stand with me as we read part of our passage this morning. Now, what part of the reasons that we, or part of the reason we, we always start with our passage, although we're not reading the whole thing today, is so that you can be confident that what we are bringing to you is from the Word of God itself. That as I've studied this week, what we're doing is emerging from the Bible, from the Word of God. And that's important to our sermon today. So look with me in verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, listen. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray that as Jesus commanded and as Jesus warns us, we pray that we would have ears to hear your word this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our main idea of the sermon this morning is that the Word of God causes followers of Christ to bear fruit and increase our understanding of God. The Word of God causes followers, to, followers of Christ to bear fruit and increase our understanding of God. So there's going to be four things that we're going to see Jesus doing in this passage. The first thing we're going to see him do is that Jesus tells about the sower and the soil. So what we're coming to is where Jesus is giving a parable here to teach. Mark has returned. The scene is back where Jesus is teaching here in Galilee after the interlude that he gave us last week. And he's giving them a parable. Now, a parable is a story that Jesus uses where he's using everyday objects or everyday situations to teach a spiritual truth. And typically in his parables, they're going to be something specific to the kingdom of God. So in other words, he's going to use everyday things to teach us something about the kingdom of God. Now, it's not necessarily an allegory. It's not necessarily a story where everything re represents something else. So when we will approach it and try to understand a parable, we shouldn't always try to see, well, right, well, this person represents this concept or this object represents this. 
Now, one of the good things that we get in this passage is that Jesus not only gives us a parable, but he's going to interpret it for us as well as we go along. So Mark has set the scene. Jesus, because the crowd has gotten so large, has basically taken his boat and turned it into a pulpit. And he got in the boat, and uh, some people say this might be, um, if you go to the region, you'll see there's a little bit of a cave or, or at least a, a wall. And so some people say that the acoustics meant that when he talked, it would have carried it farther so people who were farther away could have heard him speaking. Um, you know, that's just something that, so that may be what's, what's happening here. So Jesus is speaking from the boat to this large crowd. And let's see what he says. Look with me in verse 3. That's where we'll pick up the passage. Verse 3, chapter 4. It says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. And so he warns them, Listen, listen to what I'm about to say. And he tells about the first, uh, the, about again, this parable of the sower and the seed. And it says, The sower at first sows seed, but the seed that he first scatters lands on the ground. So the picture is a sower who has a pouch or a bag, and he's taking seed, and he's casting it. He's sowing, he's throwing it out. And this first seed falls on hard ground. And when it falls on hard ground, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't get below the soil, so it doesn't grow. It'd be like me taking seed out here and throwing it on the sidewalk. It's just going to lay on the sidewalk. Nothing's going to happen, and it eventually becomes food for the birds because it doesn't, it doesn't get below the soil. The bird comes by, and he swoops it up, and he eats it. Look at verse 5. On other, other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. So this next seed does find some soil, but the problem is, is that the soil is too shallow. It says it's on rocky soil. So in the region where Jesus is teaching, likely what this means is that there was a thin layer of soil that was just laying right on top of a limestone bedrock. And so the seed goes into the soil. It begins to germinate. But as the, as the plant comes up, the sun hits it. And it needs to have roots that grow deeper so that it can get into the soil to pull, it, pull its nutrients but as it tries to go deeper, it runs into the stone and it stops. And so it can't withstand this intense heat that the sun and the other elements give it. And so it withers away and it dies. Verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. So here we see some that kind of goes to the side and it gets in this area where maybe there's brush and it has enough to spring up. But it's got these other brambles and briars and thorns that are choking it out. It can't compete with it. I mean, that's literally the, the, the vision you have, we should have in our mind, is of the thorns surrounding this plant so that when it comes up, it can't withstand it and it chokes it out and it dies. But finally, we're going to see some seed that makes it to some good soil in verse 8. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So within, when this seed finds the good soil or when it lands in the good soil, it's able to grow, its roots grow deep. And when it comes up, it produces fruit. It's what a plant's supposed to do, right? To produce fruit. If you've ever planted a garden or if you have any experience in any kind, of, uh, any kind of farming or gardening, you understand how important soil is to allowing seeds not just to germinate, but to grow plants and to survive and to thrive. If the soil is not what it ought to be or what it needs to be, then plants will not develop roots and they will die. So Jesus is talking about into, to this community which was agrarian and understood the terms that he's using. He's doing that to explain something else. So let's look next at what Jesus does, where Jesus explains the purpose of the parable. So before he interprets it, Jesus is going to explain its purpose. There's a purpose and a reason Jesus is sharing this Parable. Now we're given, Mark is giving here, he's changed the scene a little bit. Jesus is now in more of a private 
conversation, in more of an intimate setting. One of the things we see Mark do is he often portrays Jesus in his public teaching where he's broadly proclaiming the truths, but then there's going to be further revelation, more specific teaching in the smaller groups. So he gives this parable to a big group, but then while he's in a smaller group, he's going to explain and interpret the parable. But first he's going to give the purpose of what he's doing. And he does that beginning in verse 10. Look at verse 10. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So they've asked him, Jesus, why, what, what is it with this parable? Why did you give us this parable? What's, what's the point? And as Jesus answers their question, Jesus gives us one of his difficult sayings that we see throughout the Gospels. It's one of the difficult things for us to hear, and at times it's one of the more difficult things for us to understand. So let's look at it and try to understand what Jesus has said. He tells them in this smaller setting here in verses 10 and 11 that those with him, the disciples and others, it says, that he says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom. To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. And he says it's been given to them. Not that they've figured it out. Not that they've kind of taken the puzzle and put it all together and figured out who Jesus is. They've been given the mystery. They've been told the secret, which is Jesus. The secret to the kingdom of God is that it's been revealed in Jesus and that he is the one inaugurating this kingdom. And they have recognized that there is something to what Jesus is saying. They heard the parable and they say, I need to understand something else about this. There's something else that Jesus wants me to see, but I'm just not quite sure what it is. And Jesus says, because you recognize that, you've been given the secret and the mystery to the kingdom. But then he says, to those outside the kingdom, everything's in parables. In other words, to those outside the kingdom, they're never going to understand what I'm teaching. It's going to remain elusive to them. So the purpose of this parable is to show the split between those who are inside the kingdom and those who are outside the kingdom. Jesus is teaching in parables to make it clear who is a part of the kingdom of God and who is not a part of the kingdom of God. He's making sure these boundary lines are clear. That there are going to be those who understand and who are given the mystery, who are given the secret, and those who are not given the secret, who do not understand the mystery. Those who understand that there is a spiritual meaning and have spiritual ears to hear what Jesus is preaching and teaching. And he explains why in verse 12. He says, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. So Jesus explains that the reason then that he speaks in parables is so that some will understand and that some will not understand. Now, up front, we need to understand something here. Jesus is not speaking in strange words or in riddles intentionally so that people are kept out. Now, one of the things you see in media many times and is portrayed is people seek out the meaning of life and they climb to a tall mountain and sitting on the mountain, there's a yogi or some type of spiritual authority and they ask for the meaning of life and they, he gives them some kind of weird sounding riddle. And if they figure it out, then they figured out the meaning of life. That is not what Jesus is doing here. What Jesus is doing is he's explaining what he's doing by quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. So in Isaiah chapter 6, God is calling Isaiah to go preach. Yet he's telling him that not all of the people that he preaches to will receive the word of God. They will hear it, but they won't receive it. Some will hear the word of God and they will see a need to repent. Their hearts will be soft. Others will hear the word of God and they'll respond in opposite fashion. Their hearts will harden even harder and they will reject it. 
you've probably had this experience where you, you know someone, maybe you've experienced it and done it yourself, where you're headed in a direction or you're making a poor decision and someone tells you, look, don't do that. Don't go that way. Turn and go the other way. And instead of causing them to turn, they go harder in the direction they decided already. Rather than changing, they become even more resolved to continue on that path. How many of you have ever told a child, don't touch that? And what do they do? They stare you in the eye. That's what's happening. That's what happened when Isaiah preached to Israel, and that's what happened when Jesus preached in his ministry. Some will simply hear a story about the soil and the seeds, and they'll wonder what the whole thing was about, and they'll continue on in rebellion to God, not realizing that there's something deeper to what Jesus is teaching. Others will hear it and go, there's something about that that I need to know more of, and they will be given the mystery of the kingdom. Some will be given soft hearts as they hear this parable. Other hearts will be hardened as they hear this parable. And so the battle lines between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, those who are in and those who are out, are being drawn. And we need to understand and hear these parables and receive the mystery as one with spiritual ears. Remember what Paul said back in 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. It says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So until God causes you to understand, you will never understand it whether it's a parable or whether it's any other part of Scripture. Those who can hear with spiritual ears hear the words of salvation, and they understand that the power of salvation is found in God's kingdom, while those with hard hearts, or if you will, hard hearing, the parables that Jesus is teaching, they're foolish. Jesus' parables are to draw a response from the people he's preaching to. And we saw last week the myriad of responses that people have to Jesus. And the only acceptable response is in faith and repentance. And when there is faith and repentance, that means that we have heard spiritually. But it is through this process of hardening and softening hearts that's what's eventually going to lead Jesus to the cross. In a few weeks, we're going to see where Jesus gives a parable, the parable of the tenants, to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees understand perfectly what he's saying because he's insulting the Pharisees. And he says, you're the ones that came and killed the son. And the Pharisees know exactly, hey, he's talking about us. But instead of softening their hearts, their hearts get hardened. And they gave in further resolve that, hey, we are going to kill Jesus. We're going to put him to death, and we're going to take him out. So even though they comprehended what Jesus was teaching, their hearts continued to harden. But yet this is what had to happen for our salvation. So through this hardening and softening of hearts, through Jesus' teaching, particularly through parables, it's moving, again, the kingdom down the road. So the purpose of parables is not simply to be an object lesson. It's not something to help children understand, although I believe children are able to understand these parables. It's a tool which Jesus is using to show who's in and who's out. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And through the use of parables, God is doing this. Next, we'll see that Jesus now explains the parable. Jesus explains the parable. Now that he's given the purpose, he's going to explain and interpret. Look at verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all of the parables? He says, look, this parable is is important to understanding all of what I'm going to teach you. It's going to be the framework for two reasons. One is you need to understand this parable so you understand who I am so that you understand what I came to do. And he said, you're going to also need to understand it so you understand what it means to follow me, to understand who I am and to understand what it means to be my disciple. Those are two things you need to understand, and you will see these in this parable. In verse 14, he says, the sower sows the word. Jesus is the sower. 
He's the one who brings the word of God, which is the seed. He just told us here. He is the one who brings the kingdom, and he's the one who has the pouch and is scattering the seed, sowing the seed. Verse 15, and these are the ones along the path. He's going to begin to explain each of the soils. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. So he deals first with the hard soil. The soil is so hard, it's almost like a stone where people have walked. That's why he says the path. This is the sown, the seed that is sown in verse 9. Now, maybe these people are cynics. Maybe they hear the word of God and just because they're cynical, they refuse to accept anything that might be religious. Maybe they don't believe that there's anything wrong with them and they don't see that they're in need of salvation. They don't see that they're in need for forgiveness. And so they are given over and taken by Satan. There is an adversary and there is a conflict between two kingdoms in our world. That's what the Bible explains. There is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of light, and it is at war with the kingdom of darkness, which is led by Satan. And Satan loves nothing more than to disrupt the work of God. And the, one of the ways he does this is by deceiving and blinding. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers. So they do not see that Christ is the light of the world. Their hearts are too hardened by the worldly wisdom and worldly pursuits. And they continue in blindness. And so they are taken and kept captive by Satan. Their heart is so hard that the word of God bounces off. These seeds bounce off or they just lay on the surface. Let's look at the next group in verse 16 where Jesus explains the next group on the rocky soil. It says, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now here we though, here are those who have heard God's word preach. They hear it proclaimed and they accept what Jesus says with joy. I'm all about that. I need that. That sounds good. And they seem to grow into maturity quickly. They may even be, appear to be converted. And it's easy for us at times to be fooled by this. And it's why Paul cautions not to put, those, put new converts in quickly, not to put them in positions of leadership quickly, because they may be those whose seed is planted, their heart may have been rocky soil. Now, that doesn't mean we need to continually question and be cynical, but we need to be wise and discerning when it comes to new believers and placing them in positions of influence. But if we look back at verses 5 and 6, we remember that the soil they're planted in or that the seed is planted in is too shallow. There's no root connecting them to the source of salvation. That's what Jesus says when he says there was no root in them. The root that gives life from between Jesus and us is not present. They do not have the full picture of what it means to follow Christ as his disciple. They don't have a root that gives them endurance and to help them persevere. It says, when the trials come, as a result of the word, they can't endure. They cannot resist the temptation to sin. Perseverance in the world comes from our union with Christ, and they do not have this union. They do not have the power of the Holy Spirit in them, although they may appear to for a season. And they fall away. Now, Jesus is not teaching that these people have lost their salvation. What he's teaching is that these are people who appear to have had salvation, but actually never did. The Bible is clear that no one can be snatched away from the master's hand. They appear to be converted and may appear to be converted for, long, for a long period of time, but are not actually converted. Now, I need to speak to something that became very prominent in the 20th century and is prominent in places today of what is called or has come to be known as easy believism. Now, what do I mean by that? There's the teaching or the practice that if you say a prayer or you walk forward at church or some event, that that's all you need to do in order to be saved. Now, what do I mean by that? That there is faith and assurance in an action of walking forward or in an action of saying a prayer and you point to that for salvation. 
Now let me explain this. Let me explain this by explaining what happens when you come to be a member here. When you come to apply and to, to say and express an, a desire to become a member here, you will at some point sit down with myself or one of our other elders, and we're going to ask you how you came to trust Christ and salvation. And many times we hear, I prayed this prayer on this day, to which we say, praise the Lord. Now what does that mean? Because what we're looking to hear is that there is evidence that you have repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus. Now, that can be expressed in a prayer. You may have cried out to Jesus for your need for forgiveness and placed your faith in him and expressed that through prayer. But if all you can point to is a prayer you prayed one time and there's never been any fruit or any evidence that you were walking with Jesus, then we need to question that. And there may be some here this morning who you find yourself in that place going, yeah, I remember I prayed that prayer at this point at this time, but I really haven't changed. Then I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, friends, to do what Paul says in Philippians, to with fear and trepidation work out your salvation. Because if all that saying a prayer was needed, it, because we are sometimes conditioned that all we need to say is this prayer in the right way, as though it's some kind of saying or some kind of incantation that's going to save us. And friends, that's not it. Yes, the Bible says we confess Jesus as Lord, and we confess it and understand that Jesus was raised from the dead. And that can be expressed through prayer, but it is not the act itself that saves us. And for far too long, we have had this misunderstanding in the church and in parachurch ministries. And too often, that heart has been, it's, it's too shallow, that soil is too shallow, and we haven't grown where there's not been any actual conversion. Now, let's look at the next soil in verse 18. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for others, other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And the next group Jesus explains are the ones that we saw back in verse 7. Now, this probably sounds the most familiar to us in our day and age. There are those who hear the word of God, and they may want to respond, but the pull of the world and its influence is allowed to have more sway. The pull of the world seems to be more influential than the pull of the word of God. The promise of riches and the promises that the world makes of influence and power sound far more compelling than a call to take up our cross and to follow Jesus, to lay all of that down and become Jesus' disciple. Their heart calls them to pursue the things of this world rather than the things of God. And what are the thorns doing in this parable? As I said, they are choking it out. They are not giving life. All of those things that we think are going to be so great have deceived us in thinking that they're going to give us satisfaction, that they're going to give us life. But life is only found in Jesus. If you're familiar with the sirens in Greek mythology, you see it in the Odyssey. You see this illustrated really well. The sirens were these creatures who appeared to be very beautiful, very attractive women. And what they did is they would sing a song to hypnotize sailors or to hypnotize people. And under this hypnosis, they would draw these people in. And when they draw them in, they would see that it wasn't a beautiful woman. It was a very, a very ugly, very dangerous creature with sharp teeth who would kill them, that would draw them in and kill them. And even we see the, the Odysseus, what he does is he ties himself to the front of the ship because he knows he can't resist it, but he just wants to still experience it. Friends, that's what the world does. That's what these thorns are doing in this parable. And we pursue what we think the world wants us to see. We will turn away and run headlong away from God. Jesus teaches this in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, he's teaching about money, but I think it applies to the battle we have with anything in the world in which we live. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus demands our total obedience. And if we try to serve two masters, then Jesus says you will have your total, one will have your total devotion and the other will have your hatred. 
So which is it going to be? Will we be devoted to Christ or will we be devoted to the world? If our soil is this soil that's among the thorns, among the world, then that question's already been answered. It's going to be the thorns. It's going to be these things we think we walk and we think we want. And the only thing it's going to do is choke us out. Let's look in verse 20. We finally see something good. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. This last group, the seeds, they are the good soil, the nutrient-rich soil. It's miracle grow. These are the people who hear the word of God, who cling to it. They see their need for faith in Christ and repentance from sin. And as they grow, as the word of God grows within them, they bear fruit. It isn't themselves. It's the word of God that is causing this fruit to be born. John 15 tells us if we abide in Christ, we will bear fruit. And as you grow in your understanding of the word of God, you grow in obedience. And as you grow in obedience, then you bear fruit, which we see in Galatians. Our love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. As we apply this, we need to look at each of the people that Jesus is teaching about in this parable. And we have to see our desperate need for God to cultivate and make ready the soil of our hearts to receive the word of God. It is not something that we can do ourselves. In Acts 16, we see the story of the conversion of Lydia. Listen to what Luke tells us in Acts. It says, And on the Sabbath day, when we went outside to the gate to the riverside, where we supposed, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thetara, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. And listen what happened. It says, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The reason that Lydia listened to Paul was because God opened her heart to pay attention. God calls within her heart to be the good soil. If we are to see people freed from the deception of Satan and realize their need for Christ who died in their place, then God is going to have to do the work in their heart to receive the word of God. It's why when we gather on Sunday nights, we want to pray for people that you are sharing Christ with. Because if God is not moving within them, they will not hear his word and they will not come to salvation. For believers, we find ourselves times, at times distracted and we find ourselves unready to receive the word of God. Where do we receive the word? We receive the word through preaching on Sunday mornings. And it's why we pray for the preaching of the word every Sunday morning. That's why when we pray throughout the week, when we're preparing sermons, we're praying that this would, that the hearts of our congregation would be ready and prepared to receive it. My prayer each week is that I don't come to you having not already learned it myself. And that's my prayer for anyone who ever stands from here and preaches. You hear the word at growth group. You hear it when we study our Bible on our own, when we meet in discipleship with others. Anytime we're coming together to hear the word of God taught, we need to pray on the way. If you're on the way to church on Sunday mornings, pray aloud with those in the car that you would receive the word. On the way to growth group, on the way to a discipling relationship, before you teach together, before you study together, pray that you would receive the word for your hearts to be good soil. We have to pray. And that's what Jesus is explaining here, that he is the one who gives us the good soil. And lastly, Jesus tells them that Jesus is the light of the kingdom. What every parable that we're going to see in the gospel of Mark and what you see in the other gospels point and point teach us that Jesus is the light of the kingdom. Look at verse 21. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So the mystery of the or the secret of the kingdom was hidden only so that it would come to light. It was hidden only that it might be revealed, but be revealed in the manner that God has ordained through the revelation given in the ministry and in the person of Jesus Christ. 
Christ has come to be the light and to give us the light of his kingdom. And the blessings of the kingdom are for those who have spiritual ears to hear. The Pharisees saw Jesus as some Johnny-come-lately, some rabbi without credentials. And they tried to stop him. And they do kill him, but that didn't stop him. Others saw Jesus as a magician. They saw him as a teacher who had even good moral things to say. But those with spiritual ears and spiritual hearing understood Jesus to be the lamp of God's kingdom who has come to save us from sin, going to the cross in our place and being raised from the dead. And we need soft, understanding hearts in order to respond in faith to him. And in verse 24, we get this promise. He said to them, pay attention that what you hear, pay attention to what you hear with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you for the one who has more will be given. Jesus says, be sure to pay attention because to the measure that you respond to the kingdom, you will receive even more in full. The more you seek to understand, the more understanding that you will be given. It's what the writer of Proverbs says. He says, give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. But the opposite is also true. Look at the verse at the end of verse 25. It says, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So what little understanding those without spiritual ears have If they don't pursue that and they don't continue in understanding that what a little understanding they have, Jesus says, I'll take it from them. That should be a sobering thought to us, friends, that our understanding of God's kingdom will grow or shrink based on what we've done with what we've already been given. So how should we then live? We ask ourselves this question, is the word of God causing me to grow in understanding and bear fruit? That's the simple question. Is the word of God causing me to grow in understanding and bear fruit? We can't miss this detail in the four soils. Three of the four soils have no growth and there's no, there's no take. Three-fourths of them. Those are not good odds. All of the people heard the word of God. The problem was not with the word of God. All of these people may have even been in church. They may be in churches all across America this morning. They may have been in church their whole life. And they're hearing the word of God, but it is not growing. It is not taking root. So friends, we must soberly consider where we are. Do not let your hearts grow hard. Pray that the Lord would keep it soft and be inviting for the word of God. If the word of God is dwelling in us richly, as Paul tells us in Colossians, then we should be bearing fruit. As we immerse ourselves in the word of God, then the seed that was planted within us, if we are followers of Christ, will grow and cause us to demonstrate these fruits. Some of the fruit that we've seen in Galatians will be more passive, while others will be more active. Joy, peace, love, at times, will seem to be more dispositions that we have. That the attitudes that we have and the ways that we interact with people will show there will be an overflow of these fruits that are being born in our lives. Not always, but someone who is joyful, that's almost more passive. Now, joy may compel us to do things, but it is something that is more passive. Love might be something that's more passive, and it may compel us to take action, but it's something that's more passive. Now, other fruits have a more active connotation, particularly the fruit of faithfulness. The fruit of faithfulness is what causes us to be obedient, to be obedient to what the word of God, which has been planted within us, is causing us to then do. Now, if we return to the parable, who was being faithful in the parable? Jesus. If we are to be faithful, we are to mimic Jesus. What's Jesus doing in the parable? He's sowing. And he's sowing broadly and he's sowing liberally. So faithfulness will be shown in our obedience and particularly in our obedience to sow. Faith isn't measured by the number of converts. That's for God to worry about. 
One of the commentaries I read this week pointed out William Carey and Adoniram Judson, who were two missionaries in India and in Burma. And they both labored for seven years at least before they saw one convert. But through their faithful ministry, we see this booming modern missionary movement begin to grow. And after about 40 years, where these men were planted, we begin to see churches growing and thriving. That was their lifetime in the period in which they were working. Faithfulness is measured in how far and how wide our sowing is in correct teaching of the word. We don't inspect the soil to make sure it's ready to receive. We sow and let God do the work within the soil. James tells us that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And when we do what the word of God says, then we will be bearing fruit. So brothers and sisters, let's rest and abide in God's word as it's been revealed in Christ. Let's pray together. God, we give you praise and we thank you that the work that is done in salvation is not our own. It is of you And Father, we thank you that all we have to do is be faithful. And Lord, we pray for the courage to be faithful. We pray, Lord, for a love of your word. We pray that we would hunger it, hunger for it, Father. That each day we would feel incomplete until we read it and until we study it, Father. And until we know and have learned something about you and until you have done a work in us. Lord God, we confess that without Jesus, we will never understand your word. And we thank you that you've given him to us. Father, the living word. And God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.